welcome to this lecture on machine learning uh, today we will be talking about uh, agglomerative clustering and uh, we will also talk about uh, classification models again why again because um, i saw some questions were given in the sample paper and uh, i thought it's good to discuss some concepts before we actually dive deep into it and tomorrow as we all know um, let me announce it in front of the group today. We will be having a problem solving session. We will solve all the questions given in the gate, data science and artificial intelligence sample paper that are from the subject machine learning. Um, there is one question, especially, which is a mixture of um, statistics and probability also. So that question we will also discuss and uh, apart from that we will discuss tomorrow um, some concepts new concepts as well some just one two concepts are new just in the exam in the in the sample paper and that also it's very easy to know all this so um, that's it so tomorrow we will tomorrow morning at 10 a.m to 11 30 a.m or 12 maybe we can extend till 12 if required. Um, you will discuss questions on the data science and AI sample paper for the questions that are part of the machine learning course. Today we will be looking at a very, very easy topic. Today it's not a big, uh, very difficult lecture. Um, we will discuss about agglomerative clustering. Okay. And then we will go into classification models and so let's begin uh, maybe i'll start with uh, clustering and uh, then we can go into uh, so a quick glance to the syllabus uh, we will cover top down but i'm thinking of writing the gate question paper as a mock test okay so what we can do tomorrow yeah good point aditya so what i can do is um, Okay, so let's do it this way. So for the questions that are asked in machine learning syllabus, um, tomorrow we will do a small mock test. We'll do a small test in the sense, I will just pull out a question, all the questions we have on machine learning, and then um, I'll give you some three, four minutes to solve the question, and then we will discuss the solution. Okay, I'll just not blatantly speak out the solution as the questions come up. I'll give you time to solve. And then later after the class is over, uh, you can evaluate where you are currently. But that's a good point. Yeah, thanks Aditya for pointing that out. So we'll again talk about today, as I said, regression and classification. Basically why we are talking about it again, you will get to know. Um, but yeah, so let's start with uh, agglomerative clustering. So you can't see the word agglomerative clustering anywhere in the syllabus, but what top down, bottom up, single linkage, multiple linkage means is something very similar to agglomerative clustering. They are parts of agglomerative clustering, which is a part of hierarchical clustering as well. So, before we go up, uh, before we start, uh, there is, uh, there is, uh, as we all know, clustering is one of the unsupervised learning problems where you do not have access to the output variable uh, you only have your x's you don't have your y's they are labeled they are not labeled data so without having a labeled data what you do is you discover patterns in your data set so data set that are in close proximity to each other they form something we call a cluster so that is just basic 101 on cluster but so if i have let's say a set of data points so let me just give a small example of cluster so so that so it's good for recap recap recapitulation um yeah so yeah. so let's say we have some data points and these are not labeled so i can't label them as greens or reds or whatever i used to do earlier because i don't know the class of data points. let's say these data points are this one okay and let's say these are data points okay. 
let me give you a real life example of where you can use clustering imagine you are the owner of a supermarket okay and what you do is you try to find out that given a person p pi let's say any person pi you want to find out whether he goes to floor 1 of the supermarket or floor 2 of the supermarket there are two floors in the supermarket and what you are doing is you have your cctv cameras and all that can detect that a person pi is either purchasing from floor 1 or floor 2 okay let's say your floor 1 contains clothing you have clothes while your floor 2 has um, electronics so again you're not doing anything okay what you are doing is you are looking at a person pi and then what you are doing is there is a line let's say this you are dividing this into two parts the people on the left side are people who are in floor 1 and the people who are in the right side are the people who are in floor 2 let's say you want to let's say there is a 50% discount voucher on clothing okay now this graph here has told you that the people who are before this line which is the people who are belonging to this part are people who actually are purchasing the clothes from your shop so the voucher you may, may want to give it to them because someone who is buying electronics would not do anything that much in clothing and similarly if you have a discount coupon for electronics you would want to give it to the people who are coming to the floor too so this is one of the simple examples of clustering now how do we find the clusters different clusters we already looked at one algorithm i hope you are you remember there is a question in the sample paper as well called k means algorithm right k means algorithm where number of the, where the value k means the number of clusters so you might have you initialize let's say two clusters in this case and then you try to find the relative you find you use some distance metric to find the distance of the points from that cluster centroid and then update the cluster center and eventually you will find that at one point of time there won't be no um, data points that will be uh, updated so that's when you stop and how do you find the number of clusters you use something called elbow method but all that i think you are aware of but the main thing about k means clustering was we can eyeball the data the human can see the data and human over here can say that in this data set there belongs two clusters one is this one and the other one is this one two clusters are there we know but how would the computer know there are two clusters beforehand right how would your algorithm know so that's why the elbow method came into picture you will try for different values of k and then you will try you will measure the within cluster sum of squares error and then it will fall a elbow shape curve and then wherever you see the minimum could be here could be here you can take that as a number of clusters k dash so that is one of the ways to do it but is there something we can do better okay which in the sense i mean to say let's say if i have n data points okay let's say i have n data points okay and i want to cluster them okay what i can assume first is that each of them are one cluster in itself x1 is a cluster x2 is a cluster x3 is a cluster x5 is a cluster xn is a cluster and now what i do is i use some distance metric some distance metric and that 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 i use to find the distance from each pair of points so 
given any distance metric could be euclidean distance manhattan distance anything i'll find the distance of each pair of points xi xj let's say when i found the uh, the the distance between two points x1 and x2 came to be very close to each other so what i will do is i will try to club them together and say this is one cluster And then later on, let's say X1 and X2, they are they are very close to X4. So I can club X4 with X1 and X2, and I say that my this is my new cluster. Okay. Later on, I find that X3 and X5 are also very close to each other. Okay, and so on. And at the end of the tree, if I go on like this, end result, which is the root node of the tree, will contain all the data points x1, x2, dot, 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 till xn. Now tell me one thing here. Have I ever talked about the value of k, how many clusters we need? Nothing. I'm trying to build the cluster starting from each individual element all the way to the entire data set, which is my root. This type of clustering is called bottom-up clustering. Okay, this type of clustering I call bottom-up clustering. And bottom-up clustering means so bottom up clustering means starting from each individual data point xi you consider those xi as a cluster using some distance or similarity metric you try to club two elements together and eventually once you reach the root node which contains all the entire data set your algorithm stops so there are two types of bottom up clustering in your syllabus one is called single linkage and the other one is called multiple linkage now what do they mean it's very simple okay let me tell you just namesake it's very simple okay so we'll discuss an example and then that will make things better now the other type of clustering as is written in the slide title, is called top down clustering. What is top down clustering? You do the opposite. You consider the entire data set as one cluster. And then you try to find out the distance of each pair of points xi, xj. And then you try to break down the cluster into individual components. Again, we will see this. And this type of clustering is also called divisive clustering approach. But again, we will look into it. That should not be an issue. It's very simple okay we'll look into with an example okay so now let's start with uh, bottom up clustering algorithm which is called single linkage and for single linkage uh, clustering algorithm i will consider a very small data set okay so the data set consists of two features x1 or x and y let's call it x and y that's fine these are just two features okay there is no target variable okay don't be confused with why there's no target variable in unsupervised learning so just the name is x you can call x1 x2 anything z w anything four three one four two one three eight six nine and five one these are set of six data points that you consider. So the value of n is six. N denotes the number of data points in your algorithm. Okay. The first thing that you do is you calculate something called the proximity matrix. Okay. 
Now, what is the proximity matrix? It is denoted by, let's say, P. It is again an N by N matrix, where N denotes your number of data points. And uh, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and P6. And here P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. And the value of each cell in this matrix, let's say the value at this cell over here is nothing but the distance between the point P1 and P2. Okay. And you can use any distance metric you want to. Uh, in this example, I'm using the Euclidean distance. I hope you know what it is, right? Two points x, x1, y1, x2, y2 distance is x2 root over x2 minus x1 whole square plus y2 minus y1 whole square. And uh, the diagonal elements will be zero because the distance of point P1 with itself is zero. Right? Distance of point with itself will be zero. Now I have calculated already the values, so let me just plug it in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now I'm not feeling the values in this part of the region, the lower triangular part, because it is symmetric, right? The distance between P1 and P2 will be the same as the distance between P2 and P1, right? So that's why this is actually the same as the other one. So I'm just not feeling the values, but I hope you understand. So this was my first step, done. Now in the second step, what do I do is I select the minimum value in this table, right? And the matrix, I select the point, I select the cell with the minimum value. If you look carefully, the minimum will be 2.23, which is the cell points P1 and P6. So what does it say? It says the distance of a point with every other point, the minimum distance will be between P1 and P6. So P1 and P6 is my, so initially this is the bottom of clustering, right? So each data point is considered its own cluster. First, I consider P1, P6 together as one cluster, okay? Now, so what I do is my, and I will update my matrix as, now it becomes P1, P6, right? P2, P3, P4, okay. Not of space here. Maybe I have to go to the next slide. Or maybe I can borrow some from here. Okay. So P1, P6, P2, P3, P4, P5. This is also P1, P6, P2. P3, P4, okay, I have to go to the next slide. Okay. okay. Or maybe what I will do is I will just update this. Oh, okay, fine. I'll go to the next slide. Fine. So I selected P1, P6. So what I do is 
my updated matrix is now p1 p6 p1 p6 p2 p3 p4 p5 p2 p3 p4 p5 and then all as always my individual are all zeros the diagonals are all zeros and the other distances remain as it is so three point one six seven point zero seven four point four seven three point one six right now the next thing that i can club now is this minimum value in this matrix is two point eight two right so now what i can do is my new cluster is p1 p6 p3 P1, P6 was earlier, now came P3, P2, P4, P5, P2, P4, P5, so 0, 0, 0, 0, and then this is 3.16, 5.08, 6.32, 4.47, 7.07, Okay. Now, if you see now carefully, again, the minimum are here two. There are two with the same value, 3.16, which is this entire cluster containing P1, P6, P3 with P2 and P4 with P5, right? So what I do is I again, then I form the cluster and eventually you will see that it will stop, okay? So now, once I am done with the formation of the cluster, what I do is I form something called the dendogram, okay? I think I have already looked at in the hierarchy cluster part, but again, dendogram would mean, initially I have all the points. Right? And, or maybe I will not clump, this will make the, Thing a bit clumsy so what i will do is dendrogram means initially it will the the leaf node the first part will contain all the individual data points and you can see at the first what we did was we tried to club p1 and p6 so we'll write p1 and p6 this was the first step then i tried to club p1 p6 with p3 so P1, P6 with P3, okay. And then I try to club P3, this entire cluster with P2, and also P4, P5 separately, right? And then the final step will be to just club these two. So this is my dendrogram, okay. Don't assume that uh, there, there are MCQs, so dendrogram won't come. Uh, you never know, okay? Okay. They can have an option as what is the corresponding dendrogram for the single linkage data set. Okay. Now, there is a very small change when it comes to when I talk about multiple linkage clustering. In the sense, what I do is, there is one thing that I didn't do after I updated P1, P6 with P3 or P1 with P6, right? I just wrote the distances as it is. So when I clubbed P1 and P6, let's say in this scenario, when I clubbed P1, P6 with P3, my distance of that new cluster containing P1, P6, P3 with P2 remains 3.16. Similarly, the new cluster P1, P6, P3 distance with P4 remained as 5.09. And P1, P6, P3, the new distance with P5 remained as 6.32 as compared to the previous table. I just copied it. I didn't do any recalculation, right? 
but in multiple linkage what we do is we just do some one small step again which is to do a recalculation of the distances so here we rest everything remain the same and now how do we recalculate the distance so let's take a very small data set i will consider a one dimensional data set for now consisting of five data points so my n is five the first step is always to calculate the proximity matrix p over here you can use the Euclidean distance you can use the manhattan distance both will actually give the same answer because it's a one dimensional data so it is an n by n matrix okay oh so before i forget uh, okay maybe i'll ask it later okay i'll remember no problem so the distance of 2 to 2 is 0, 6 and 6 is 0, 9 and 9 is 0, 11 and 0, 3 and 3 is 0, or as always, right? And I'm not populating the lower triangular, it's a, it, it's a symmetric matrix, right? So the Manhattan distance or the Euclidean distance, both are the same in this case scenario, single dimensional data between 2 and 6 is 4, 7, 9, 1, 3, 5, 3, 2, six eight right simple nothing just difference absolute difference between the value right now first thing is you have to find out which is the smallest distance that i have which is this one the point two and three right the distance is a minimum which is one that becomes my candidate for clustering so now what i do is this is 2,3. Now remain is 6, 9, 11. 2,3. 6, 9, 11. Right? So, so 2 comma 3 will be 0 6 6 is 0 9 9 is 0 11 11 is 0 all that remains the same no difference at all but if i want to calculate the distance of 2 comma 3 with 6 right if it would have been a single linkage clustering i would have straight away said 4 right i just copied the value distance between 2 and 6 is 4 so i could have just copied the value 4 but when it comes to multiple linkage, I am kind of assuming that 2 is always the candidate that is now closest to 6. But what if I am combining 2 and 1? So let's say I was, instead of it being 3, it was 1. Then the farthest distance of the cluster from the point 6 is actually 5. Because if I am trying to combine with 1. So that is the funda here. So this is nothing but the maximum distance of 2 to 6, 1 to 6. Again, that's a confusion people might have. It's a maximum distance, not the minimum distance. Okay. You want to find out the cluster which is farthest away from this point. Okay. The point that is farthest away from this cluster. So in this scenario, then you get 4, right? 7, 9. Okay. You get the same values only, but you recalculate your distance again. Similarly, this becomes 3, 5, and 2. Others remain unchanged. The next candidate for clustering is 2. These are the points 9 and 11. So if you club them, 2, 3, 6, 9, 11, 2 comma 3, 6, 9 comma 11. Okay. Distance of 2, 3 is 0, 0, 0. Distance of 2, 3 from 6 is remaining unchanged because I have not done anything with it. Now, 
the distance of the point two three with nine eleven. is nothing but the maximum of the distance from 2 to 9-11 comma 3 comma 9-11. So if you calculate now the distance of 2 with 9-11 is nothing but the max of 2 with 9 and 2 with 11, which is 9. And from here you get 6 and 8. So it's 9. So this is 9. Hope you understand. So it's a recursive algorithm. The maximum distance D from 2 comma 3 to 9 comma 11 is the max of 2 comma 9 comma 11, the distance of 2 with 9 comma 11, and the max distance of 3 with 9 comma 11. And the distance with 2 comma 9 comma 11 is distance, maximum distance from 2 to 9 or 2 to 11. And similarly, the distance from 3 comma 9 comma 11 is maximum distance from 3 to 9 or 3 to 11. And if you calculate it will be nine so maximum distance on distance of six comma nine comma eleven is the maximum of six comma nine and six comma eleven which is five and now the next candidate is four right yeah so next candidate is uh, four that is the value six right so you have now two data set 2 comma 3 comma 6 9 comma 11 2 comma 3 comma 6 9 comma 11 so now this is 0 this is 0 and then now I'm not calculating the distance but you can do I'm just writing the answer it will be 9 okay that you can do so once this is done last part as always is to construct a dendrogram so first I considered two and three. So I will club two and three, right? Then after that, I clubbed nine and 11, right? And then what I did was I clubbed two, three with six, and then this entire cluster with nine. And 11. Okay. Now comes a very, very important topic because this topic questions were asked in the sample paper. Okay. Tomorrow we'll discuss the sample paper as I announced, but this topic is so important, so important that there will definitely be some questions from this topic. Okay. So please pay attention and it's not very difficult also. Okay. It's not very difficult. That is my guarantee to you. So no, now we are not talking about any models, nothing we will talk. Okay. We'll do nothing that difficult today. What we will do today is discuss about classification models, or let me just give a small word about regression. Okay. So in regression, your Y belongs to a continuous variable, let's say it belongs to a set of real numbers. You had a set data set, you built a model, I call it it's D of X, which is hypothesis you built using your any favorite algorithm, H D of X, anything. Okay. Let's say I ask you, what is the performance of your model? How well does your model perform? What will you answer? You might say that, sir, I had a validation set, which had some hundred data points, right? They had their corresponding X comma Y. My model predicted for X, Y prime. On average, my mean squared error is one by hundred summation i equal to 1 to 100 y bar minus y whole square how off are you from the, the true value y this is one way and other thing is you can do rmsc root mean square error by taking the square root of this term okay this is for regression 
there are few more for regression we will discuss that tomorrow okay um, which is uh, not able to recall now we'll discuss okay i have it in my notes but not able to recall now but today we'll be discussing classification model this is one way to talk about this thing right and yeah r2 square r2 score is one that is there in regression correct so today what we will do is we'll talk about classification models okay classification model in the sense i will restrict my discussion to only a binary classification problem but you can definitely extend it to a multi class scenario there is a question in the sample paper okay just letting you guys know same okay tomorrow we'll discuss what there is a question so please pay attention so how will you evaluate your classification model so let's say your model either belongs to so let's take a data set which is cancer data set okay which is you are given a set of features x you want to predict whether the person has cancer or not we call it benign okay cancer or benign cancer means a person has cancer benign means he does not have cancer so so your y belongs to either cancer or benign i'll call it c and b Achha. Now tell me one thing. How many of you have heard of this term? True positive. Has anyone here heard of the term true positive? Let's say positive class here means, although I'm not being a sadist here, positive class means that person has cancer. Negative class means the person does not have cancer. So what will be true positive? Positive means he has cancer. So what is true positive? What do you understand by the term true positive? Person has cancer. And my model also said, huh, he has cancer. That will be true positive. Correct? Correct. So my Y pred belongs to cancer and Y belongs to cancer. What is this symbol? Don't get confused. It's just and, okay? And of Boolean algebra. Nothing I have done extra here. Achha. What do you understand by this term? What do you understand by a term called two negative? Person does not have cancer and your model also says it does not have cancer. Okay. So Y pred belongs to benign and Y also belongs to benign. Now this many people get confused. I don't know why, but I will explain. You will never get confused if I tell you one trick. What is the meaning of false positive? Please answer in terms of the cancer data set. What do you understand by the term false positive? Very good. That is correct. So the model says you have cancer, but actually you don't have. And what will be false negative? The person does not have cancer. A person, your model says the person does not have cancer, but indeed the person has cancer. Hmm. So, if you were a data scientist, okay, and I give you two choices, 
whether you want to minimize false positive or false negative which would you do considering this data set what would be your choice if your if your false positives are high then you are necessarily giving heart attacks to people i mean the person does not have cancer but he might have a heart attack seeing your model says he has cancer but in reality he does not have it or if you try to minimize the false positives and don't care about the false negatives if a person does not have cancer no if a person has cancer your model will say sorry sir you are okay sorry sir or ma'am you are okay but indeed he had cancer so that is also an alarming thing right both both of them are very um difficult things to digest right maybe what what if i would have been the data scientist was i would have focused on minimizing the false negatives because false positive i could have said it's just a model take a second opinion if you are getting a cancer outcome but false negative please try to minimize in the model because if a person actually has cancer and if my model is trying to say it does not have it god bless that person okay but now since you know some part of this now what i will do is there are four data points you have now right for a given classification model true positive true negative false positive false negative i will put them in the form of a matrix okay matrix consists of 2 by 2 always it's 2 by 2 okay the rows denote the prediction and the columns denote the actual positive negative positive negative okay your prediction is positive and your actual is also positive i mean the model predicted you have cancer and actually you also have cancer that is your number of true positives come in this cell your model predicted negative actual may you are negative so this cell comes as true negative now many people get confused i don't know why with false positive and false negative i will explain you how you can learn this okay see you can't change the actual data right your actual data might say it's positive or negative but your model is saying let's say let's say in actual you do not have cancer but your model is saying positive okay. actual data cannot be changed you can change the model you can tune the model so that this positive now model somehow tries to find out that it is negative okay but what you can do here is your model is positive but actual may you are negative so your model is false your model is false positive its prediction is not correct okay so false positive similarly your actual was positive model predicted negative okay. model predicted negative and uh, so your model was a false negative okay this matrix is very popularly called as confusion matrix this matrix is called as uh, confusion matrix okay fine now i will give you one very small anecdote i remember um when i was working as a data scientist long back um i mean it it will sound a bit funny but uh, one of my friends was working in one company i don't want to name that here let's call it x okay and uh, the company was trying to predict given the features of a person x the y was whether he should be dispersed alone or not for instance the 
features would have been the credit score of the employer uh, of of the person x or the um the age of the person x or the income of the person x monthly income gross income of the person x all these were the features and as funny as it might sound again i'm not again i'm here not doing any controversy here but this was actually the case my friend was given a task to get a accuracy of 76% on this model somehow okay what he did was he got 72% and what he thought was 72% is the accuracy there could be some feature which might fit to the noise of the data so x had some features like as i said some set of features x1 till xt now you don't have this in syllabus but what you can do is he trained something called a random forest model random forest classifier model okay random forest means if you have learned decision trees it's just many decision trees working in tandem working together and that is called random forest that is not there in the syllabus that's why i didn't teach so that's called bagging so he he again think of it as a black box think of it as a model and uh, what he what the random forest model can now do is it can rank the features by their power which means which are the most important feature for which the data set was working very well and it will rank from top to bottom any guesses what would have been the top feature any guess credit score age any any guess what would be, have been the top feature or I mean the feature that was contributing the most for this model income anyone else what do you think and again it's a big organization okay it's a very big organization the data set is like crores of data age come on guys come on, come on. so my model will say if you are more than 50 years of age sorry sir i can't give you loan Ah, okay, this might sound funny, but you know what was the top feature? Again, I don't want to spark controversy. I'm telling you again, the top feature was gender. And if I again, thanks, Aditya. Correct. If I remove gender, if I remove gender, then my model is now fifty-four percent accurate. Can you put gender as a feature now? It's more like there is a person X. The model will say, "Sir, sorry, I can't give you loan because you are a male," or "Sorry, I can't give you a loan because you are a female." So, what can I do in this case? See. the thing is every of everything of this is validated by the manager okay this is a big company you want to you will put your report what features you have used for the model everything you can't say i'm use gender so what will you do acha if i tell you you are male you might be offended if i tell you you are zero if i tell you you are female you might be offended if i tell you you are one and instead of gender i will say some feature f1 i will not call it as gender problem solved i i will say i am using a feature f1 and the feature f1 i do a simple transformation If you give me an x, if it is a male, I will make it zero. If it's a female, I will make it one. And this is what is actually done in the model, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, this is how data scientists work, right? So that's just a small anecdote I wanted to share. This actually happens if you work as a data scientist. You will get to see such features 
gaining traction as well okay simple could be the gender uh, the loan dispersal application could maybe just take the credit score and decide but credit score was not the most important feature okay. fine so this was just small small anecdote small thing i just wanted to talk about because i remember because he was showing me the confusion matrix and <laughs> right so it was a amazingly made model 72% right so that's fine okay fine so now there are once you have drawn the confusion matrix um, there are some small things that are present in that okay um, again it's just very basic stuff okay there is something called sensitivity and specificity so what is sensitivity the sensitivity of your model will mean how many true positives you had divided by how many true positive how many total positives are there in your data set which means if your data set had let's say 100 positive samples and your model could only predict 81 of them as positive remaining 19 are negative so these are false negatives so out of those 100 positive samples you had how much of them are actually how much how much of them where have you gotten them correct okay now another thing is called specificity okay which is how many negatives have you predicted divided by total negatives are present in the data set same as that if you have 100 negative samples 81 of them you classify as negative remaining 19 are false positives so out of all the negative samples you have in your data set how many of them are actually negative and this thing is also called recall just a word okay it's called recall there is one more thing called precision precision means out of all the positives that you have predicted which includes your true positives and your false positives i have exceeded annotations so let me erase controversial stuff from my slide okay so out of all the positives that your model has predicted which is your true positives plus false positives how many of them are actually positive that's your precision of your model okay and one more thing that you will be able to guess by now is called accuracy and what is accuracy anyone who knows in terms of true positives false negatives and all so accuracy would mean How much of you are getting true positive plus true negative among all the data points? True positive plus true negative plus false positive plus false negative. Out of all the data points you have, how many of them you are actually predicting positive given positive and negative given negative? So that is your uh, accuracy. Now, the last thing of today's lecture and this part of the uh, evaluation of classification models is something called ROC and AUC, ROC curve, okay. ROC and AUC also is there, okay. uh, so F1 score, correct, correct, so F1 score is a combination of some precision and recall, I am I'm not able to recall the exact formula now, but F1 score is, if you want to, so see, precision maintains out of all the positives you have in your data set, how many, how many positives you have predicted in your data set, how much of them, how much of them are actually positive, 
and recall is among all the negatives in your data set how many of them are you have actually prepared as negative and then you can combine these two metric to find a singular score okay which is called f1 score okay there is there is a generic formula f alpha score as well i will discuss that tomorrow good point actually i was not able to recall but yeah now and now i don't even recall the name i just now i when you said i recalled it so there is something called f1 score there is something called f alpha comma beta score okay that's the most generic form of a score i'll discuss that tomorrow okay remind me or i will remember that's fine i'll discuss it tomorrow f f1 score f2 score okay there are some more as well okay the last part which was asked in the sample paper as well is something called roc curve okay so what roc curve is something very simple okay so let's take a small data set and uh, let's say this denotes okay, this is not straight right let me make it straight take some time to run right try to make it straight if it does not then sorry okay tried my best so let's say i have two classes um and uh, the x axis denotes feature x right and let's say i have two classes uh one is omega 1 and the other one is omega 2 okay. two classes are there in my data set and uh, these are the data points for class uh, omega 2 and uh, these are the data points for class omega 1 okay right now let's say if you want to fit a logistic regression model and then what you do is you do something like this right you will do something like this some 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 something like this because in logistic regression you fit a sigmoid curve and this is the sigmoid curve that is present and let's say you have a threshold set at 0.5 so the y axis is now the probability of y given x where y could be anything of omega 1 and omega 2 and uh, if if you have let's say a data point here right let's say this is a data point right if you now go to the top and come here you will say it falls above 0.5 so you will classify this as green okay so this is what my model says okay now see one thing very important here focus on uh, this data point here okay which is actually a red okay but if you look carefully the model will actually predict it as a green right so this is a false positive right and similarly i'm not sure if this will actually give a false negative but if, if you look at this mod this point here and uh, this is nothing but okay this is also true to ne negative but let's move this point a bit here just for example sake let's move it a bit here okay now if you see carefully then your model will actually predict this as a red right but is actually a green which is a false negative so there are two terms present here in the uh, literature one is called uh, okay okay so okay fine fine okay so if i just consider this model here right this data set here what will be my confusion matrix so my confusion matrix will look something like this 
so there are this is my true positives this is my true negatives this is my false positives this is my false negative right so there are one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ten data points right what is my true positive anyone who wants to take a guess by looking at the data set how many true positives i have in the data true positives are the points which are actually positive so this point this point this point this point and this point right and if you find the model prediction besides this point which is the point here which is classified as negative because if you again draw a line from here to hit here and this is below the threshold below 0.5 and so you can say that this is not uh, correct so true positives are four right and false negative will be one okay now how many are true negatives so you focus on the negative points this one this one one this one this one and if you see all are actually correctly class no so there is one not correctly classified if you look at this point right and uh, this is not correctly classified even the threshold so that's why uh, your true negative is also four false positive is one this is your confusion matrix okay now let's say if i give you a small task that you i want let's say you are a data scientist working in my company i'm your manager i am telling you that i don't care i do i i just need zero false positives okay i tell you that i need zero false positives i do not care what your model does i just need zero false positives okay i'm very strict in this opinion what can you do one thing that you can do is you can say that hey what i will do is this threshold right i will increase the threshold which means my new threshold will be here okay now this point is going here coming here just below the line and i can say that this model is now perfectly there are zero false positives in this model but there is one false negative which is this point here so you can adjust your threshold accordingly whatever you want to do in this case so depending on different thresholds depending on the different thresholds you have different confusion matrices and uh, a way to summarize the confusion matrices was come up a uh, new new technique was come up which was called the roc curve receiver operating characteristics curve what is that curve so again let me say these two examples let me have two examples the other example was you were classifying everything correctly negatives all correctly there were no false positives okay and in the other extreme if you have a line let's say here right let's say this is your threshold then if you observe carefully um let's say this point here it comes here which is above the line right you will classify this as positive uh, correctly as positive and then you can also then your uh, the new model will have no uh, no false negatives right but will there be a false positive okay there won't be even a false positive okay that would be the best model that you can build no false positive no false negative but yeah so i hope you get the point now you can draw confusion matrices for each of this scenario and then try to um, calculate the uh, try to find your findings but there was one typical thing called roc curve that was made that was made such that your uh, your uh, what shall i say you you will be able to summarize your confusion matrix in a better manner so how does the roc curve is designed is it is a xy axis plane 
right? It's an XY axis plane where your X axis denotes your false positive rate and the Y axis denotes your true positive rate where your false positive rate is nothing but how many false positives you have divided by false positive plus true negative okay and uh, so these are the to total number of negatives you have in your data set which is how much are true negative and how much are negative that you have classified as positive so what is a false positive rate and the true positive rate is nothing but true positive by true positive plus false negative right? true positive rate is how many positives you have in your data set among them how much you have classified as true positive which is nothing but your sensitivity or your recall as well so what you will do is for given values of threshold so if you put your threshold here and eventually you put your threshold up you will get a curve you will get a line something like this you will get a line something like this and uh, which means then there could be scenarios where you improve the model and given the same threshold you get a new data point which is this which means your true positive rate is uh, higher false positive rate has reduced this is a better model and let's say the next time you get something like this maybe your false positive rate has gone much lower but your true positive rate has also gone a bit lower as well and uh, similarly you'll get something like this also okay these are some example points i have and another model that you make you will have some data points like this again this is just an example so now this thing and i will use a different color this thing are two different curves this is the area under this curve and the other one is the area under this curve so the more you are moving towards the left that means your model is becoming better and better which is a true positive rate as your false positive rate is going down as well as your true positive rate is also not that much compromise in the sense if you look at the red curve here then even though your false positive rate was going down your true positive rate was also going down at a much faster pace but if you look at the black curve or the black points the false positive rate even though were going down the true positive rate was also either same or little bit going down lesser than the red part so the area under the curve let's say this is of model one and this is of model two the area under the curve of model one is greater than the area under the curve for model two and so i can say that my model one is better than model two again this is one way to summarize your confusion matrix okay and there is another small thing that is there we will discuss it tomorrow when we discuss the questions which is which is imbalanced data set if you have an imbalanced data set then roc curve is much better metric than something called accuracy right so this was very basic about uh, roc and all roc is nothing but if you first take a cartesian plane x axis denotes your false positive rate y axis denotes your true positive rate you calculate for different values of the threshold what is the value for the false positive and the true positive okay so here at this point you can say that your true positive rate is the same as a false positive rate okay which means something like you have all as the same value okay so in that case you can think of it that way and uh, if you improve your model you don't want to come at this area because that is not the right way that is not correctly thing that not the correct thing to do means you are making your model worse you are increasing your false positive rate decreasing your true positive rate that is also something that you don't want to do so you want to be in the left side of that line right so this line denotes the part where oops this line denotes this line is the portion where your true positive rate is the same as the false positive rate and then you will gradually reduce your true positive uh, reduce your false positive 
with the cost of not improve not reducing a true positive that much and the area under the curve which is more will give you the better model so uh, so with this actually i don't have much to speak about today anymore uh, tomorrow we will be going into talking about the questions uh, there are some new concepts also you will learn because this was an overview course this was not very comprehensive so i didn't talk about very deep things so i would have talked a lot about many things as well there is one question on kernel svm i didn't actually talk about kernel svm at all tomorrow we'll talk about it very simple it won't be very difficult for that you also no need to know svm as well but i hope you know that by now but uh, yeah i mean tomorrow there are some nine questions or 10 questions on ml one question i think it is a mixture of statistics and ml so i will try to discuss it because it's part of ml as well um right so what i will do is i will end the class today uh, i will not teach any longer for now tomorrow morning we'll meet at 10 am and in case you have any questions i think uh, good very good okay so sahil is asking what does it mean by the auc of ml and m1 and m2 right okay good good question so you understood the graph is between the false positive rate and the true positive rate correct yes. so let's say that let me just remove this thing let's say that you have a model so again okay let's do one thing okay for this scenario what is the true positive rate for the first case so the first case the true positive rate is 4 by 5 right and the true false positive rate is false positive by false positive plus true negative so again 1 by 5 right correct hope that is clear right so point 8 point 2 so you will calculate you will plot the value um okay should be opposite i mean point 2 comma point 8 because the x axis is point 2 so let's say this is point 2 let's say this is point 8 you will calculate here okay now you change your threshold okay you now change your threshold and now this is what you get you get 0 by 5 and 4 by 5 which is 0 comma pointed so 0 comma pointed let's say this is the value okay similarly so this line right this is y equal to x so whatever is the false positive rate is the same as a true positive rate so i hope i don't have to explain what is this line correct hope that is clear and with different values of your confusion matrix different values of your false positives and false negatives you will plot this curve okay adjusting your threshold so let's say with the model you made this was your final data points you had so you can join this and form this curve okay let's say this was for m1 your logistic regression model i come up and i draw something called a decision tree okay decision tree will also have a corresponding set of predictions corresponding set of confusion matrix correct sign yes so let's say in the case of decision matrix you are never getting these set of data points you get something like this is one let's say this denotes a certain false positive rate and a certain false negative rate let's say this one is another model where you are so you can see right your true positive rate has gone down a lot even though your false positive rate came down as well but your true positive rate also came down a lot let's say the another data point is this so now this is another line this is another curve and what i do is now if i ask you a question let's say this is for model 2 which model is performing better the m1 or m2 why m1 because see this is the training set this is the training set and you want to make sure that you are able to perform well on the test set so whichever model has generalized better is the better model so m1 here the performance of m1 is very 
much better than M2, right? M2, even though the false positive rates are lower, are low as well, but you're also compromising on the true positive rate. That is not something that you need, right? How will you say it mathematically? How will you say that this is mathematically M2 is not that good? Area under the curve. So this is the area under the curve for M2. This is the area under the curve for M1. Which has a better area under the curve? Area under the curve of M1 is better than that of M2. So I can say that M1 is better than M2. Now, depending on the different scenarios what people have also done is they have kind of changed this to this will also work for false negative and true negative rate so you will have your corresponding formulas changed as well which is true negative by true negative plus false negative right oh sorry uh ah, false positive i guess sorry and similarly false negative rate is false negative by false negative plus true positive so people have also tried to so it depends on which class you want to minimize the more, which class you want to evaluate the more, right? So for example, in my cancer data set, as I told, I would maybe look at minimizing my false negatives more, right? I would not want someone to go home saying you are absolutely okay, considering the fact that he has cancer, he or she has cancer. So it depends on it, but it's not a thumb rule that it's always false positive rate and true positive rate. You can, people have used true negative rate as well. It depends on what you want to do. So ROC and AUC are relative. Once you have the ROC, which is, okay, the full form of ROC, I think Andrew never said, it's called receiver operating characteristics. And AUC is ready under the curve. Okay, hope that is clear. There is a question as well in the sample paper. Uh, question number three or five, I guess. Uh, six, I guess. No, 11, 11 or 13, I guess. We'll discuss it tomorrow, okay? Same, same thing. But the question is a bit twisted. You will see that whatever I teach today, the question is actually something very different. But you still have to know about ROC to um, at least get some hint of it. Okay. Fine. Anything else? If not, then Aditya, I think you had some questions, right? Sahil, you have any question? Feel free to ask. No problem. Okay, yeah, so the F1 score, I just checked now, is nothing but a harmonic mean of your precision and recall. So it's a way you can combine the two measurements you did for precision and recall. If you, let's say, want to focus more on precision, then you only look at precision. If you want to say you want to look more at recall, you only look at recall. But if you want a combination of the two that you want to minimize, you will look at something called the F1 score, which is nothing but your harmonic mean of your precision and recall. So make sure you know these formulas. There could be direct questions to calculate. You will be given a confusion matrix and told to calculate the F1 score or anything. And very simple, right? If you know the formula, then there's nothing actually you have to do. You have the calculator as well. Okay. Thanks for asking, Sahil. I think this was, I think I missed it the slide also okay fine how to okay this is toc now okay fine uh okay so hmm. very good question actually very good question so how to mark so your ml class is over okay make sure if you don't want to listen to toc you can exit that's fine okay so so let's draw a very simple epsilon anyway this is my final state um let's say i have epsilon transaction here there is an a comma epsilon okay 
just a simple epsilon nfa yes let's say this is um, 1 2 3 4 and uh, 4 3 is my final state correct aditya any doubts with the diagram nothing i guess okay huh. now tell me how will you convert it, it convert this into nfa Or maybe DFA you can convert it directly to a DFA, which is an NFA as well. How will you convert this to an NFA or a DFA? You will calculate something called the okay, good. So epsilon closure of one is yes no doubts i guess the so epsilon is free transition okay it's like standing somewhere without doing anything without seeing any input where can i go to i can go to four from one and from four i can go to three so i can in fact from one i can go to one four three Okay, what is the epsilon closure of 2? Good, you have written all, very good. Now, what else? Next step. You look at the input, right? And let's say my alphabet sigma is a comma b okay. and epsilon is there because it's an epsilon nfa but a comma b is my set of alphabet okay one if the state is one you consider one three four as the epsilon nfa and then from one on an input a you go to two from three on an input a you go nowhere and from four on an input you go to three correct aditya no doubt now what you do again you take the epsilon closure which is two comma three yes so from input one you go to two comma three now tell me will will this be a final state What do you think? Will this be a final state, Aditya? Yes, sir, was for this or the previous question? Why cannot this be a final state, Aditya? No, incorrect reasoning. See, forget the conversion. Forget the con. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. See, forget the conversion. Okay. Look at the epsilon NFA only. Now tell me, if I have an input W as just an A, will I reach a final state? Just look at the epsilon NFA. Forget about the conversion. If you look at the epsilon NFA from one, can you reach three? How? Answer. How can you reach from one to three? What will be the transition? Transition from one, where will you go? That's 
then why can't okay fine good very good okay so you can you know how to read this epsilon and epsilon now the conversion says that if i need to find from one on looking at an input a where can i go i first have to find out from one without looking at any input for free where can i go and that is why you calculate the epsilon closure correct yes or no what is the epsilon closure of one saying standing at one if i do not look at any input where can i go to i can go to one three four now since i am now in three states instead of just one if i look at that input a i had where will i land from one if i see that input a i go to two from three if i see that input a i don't know where to go that's why i call it five from four on that input a i go to three correct so you are telling me that you are going to three looking at the input a understood you are telling me you are going to the input uh, to the state 3 right by just looking at a because this is the free transition right this part this part is the actual transition you did by looking at that input a which is you went to 3 and once you went to 3 let's say if it would have been something like this again why do i take an epsilon closure again let me explain let's say if i had something like this okay from 1 free me i can go to 4 okay i am i won't be able to go to 3 now but with with paying nothing i can go to 4 correct just focus on one aditya i don't want to confuse you from 1 i can go to either 1 or 4 without paying anything from 4 looking at a i can go to 5 yes but when i am in 5 am i also in 3 i lost you when i am in 5 without looking at anything i can also be in 3 right because there is an epsilon transition so that's why i take the epsilon closure later as well and i combine the all the epsilon closures so from 2 epsilon closure is 2 from 5 epsilon closure is 5 comma 3 so i combine them and i get 2 3 5 so i say here starting from 1 looking at the input a i land in these set of states 2 3 and 5 and one of them are is the final state that's why this is also a final state if you ever get confused with why it is still working look at the epsilon nfa and then answer because the main part about the conversion is the power of epsilon nfa should be the exact same as the power of the dfa okay it cannot be that in epsilon nfa from 1 i can go to the final state looking at a and the dfa me i can't go then your dfa is wrong understood aditya or any other doubt ask me do you want me to do for some some other as well let's see for b what happens let's see for b okay i will only leave you if you say i understood so that is my goal let's look at b now tell me just look at the epsilon nfa and tell me are you reaching the final state by looking b from one no so my dfa also should not reach my dfa also should not have three as one of the final states i reach correct okay first is if i look at one can i say i am also in one and i am also in four That is epsilon closure. 
from one looking at b can i go anywhere no from four can i go anywhere looking at b no so which means i can't go anywhere so i can say i am in a trap state or a dead state because a dead state is a state where you can't go from there anywhere you know where you can go from dead state right so i can say that if i have both as phi then i am going to a dead state yes so now let's look at 2 uh, now look at the dfa uh, challenge and fa tell me if you are standing in 2 and reading the input a can you go to the final state No, no, no. I, ha, okay, fine. But here there is no dead state, right? Can you go to a final state? No. So from 2, without looking at any input, I stay in 2. I can't go anywhere else. There is no epsilon transition. Looking at A, I go to a dead state. Fine. And this is nothing but I call it a dead state. Similarly, 2, 2 on a B, can I go to a final state? Good. Very good. 3. So if I am in 3, I am also in 3 only. Because from 3, there is no epsilon transition. Right? Now look at 3. Now look at 3. 3. If I am in 3, then I am also in 3 only. If I look at an input A, I go to dead state. If I look at an input B, I also go to a dead state. Correct? From 3, I don't have any transition. Right? Now, interesting thing will come for 4. Let's see. Oh, 4 is now the silent closure is only 4 because I have put that thing here. Okay, fine. Okay, the interesting part will become. So, 4 has an silent closure of 4. So, without looking at any input, you are saying if I am in 4, I am also only in 4. Okay. On an input A, can you reach a final state? Look at the epsilon NFA and answer. Look at the epsilon NFA and answer. Don't look at the conversion. Conversion doesn't matter. Look at the epsilon NFA and answer. 4 on an input A. I am going to 5, yes. From 5, without looking at any input, Without doing anything, no no effort, anything, no not looking at any input, which is I am looking at epsilon only. Can I go to a final state from 5? So if I stop my algorithm here, I can say I am not going to the final state. But this is incorrect, right? When I am in 5, I am also in 3 now because it's free. So which means that's why I take again an epsilon closure and say I go to 5, comma 3. 3 is my final state so i this will be my final state understood yes no c on b what will be that state because on b i am going to phi and phi means you are not going anywhere so it's a dead state See, uh, take an example, okay, and then try to understand. See, what is, I think when I explained this, I told you a trick. Maybe I'll explain it again. The thing is to ask yourself always. You are standing in 4. Or let's say, let's start with the beginning. You're standing in 1. In Epsilon MFA, it has a feature that if you're standing in 1, you're also standing somewhere else as well which is without looking at any input, you are also standing somewhere else. Else, One thing is trivial. If I'm standing in one, I can say I'm also standing in one. If I'm standing in one, I can say I'm also standing in four because it's free. It's an epsilon transition. It's free. Right now, once I look at the input A, my one gets me to 
टू एंड आई कैन गो फ्रॉम फोर टू फाइव लुकिंग एट द इनपुट ए नो वेन आई एम इन स्टेट टू और वेन आई एम इन स्टेट फाइव आई कैन ऑल्सो क्लेम दैट आई एम इन स्टेट थ्री एज वेल बिकॉज देर इज एन एपल ट्रांजिशन फ्रॉम फाइव टू थ्री बट इफ आई एम इन स्टेट टू आई एम ओनली इन स्टेट टू बट इफ आई एम इन स्टेट फाइव आई एम ऑल्सो इन स्टेट थ्री थ्री राइट अंडरस्टूड आदित्य मे बी टेक एन एग्जाम्पल सॉल्व इट योर सेल्फ एंड लेट मी नो इफ यू स्टिल हैव अ कंफ्यूजन just you have to do it once on your own you will get it okay hey. fine take an example solve it on your own take any gate example only or a simple example like this only what i drew here okay hey. take a simple example try to convert it and then you will get it it's not very difficult ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री गेट पेपर ओके वॉट इज द क्वेश्चन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री गेट पेपर ऑन सी एस ई let me see what are the questions given accordingly um okay consider the following front end uh, max super dfa dfa entity av um this is a uh, now dfa with epsilon transitions okay algorithm as advisory multiplexer pick table conjecture which of the following cpu scheduling algorithms maxima minima graphics radix number pipelining keyboard mcc programs is it a two mark question or a one mark question question 40 or so okay maybe the ordering will be different here let me see all right yeah this is 40 as well consider the pda p below which runs on the input alphabet a b and a stack alphabet tau 1 a and has three states s comma p comma q with s being the start state okay transition from u to stream label where c is an input symbol okay x is the stack symbol and gamma is a string of stack symbols that is the fact that in state u the pda can read c with x on the upper stack pop x from the stack push in the string gamma on the stack and go to state v correct initially the stack has only symbol tau in it pda accepts by empty stack which of the following options correctly describes the language accepted by p yeah so what is your answer let me draw the pda here for discussion so it's a start state s and then here you are going here you are going to q on what epsilon a epsilon epsilon a epsilon and then here you are epsilon 
a epsilon epsilon tau epsilon yeah so this is the pda okay so all are a and b n right all are a and b n correct so it's certainly it's not option d right which is sorry the, the options might be switched here so option d here is am 0 m is greater than 0 union bn n is greater than equal to 0 this does not have this does not consider any combination of uh, am with bn so if you look at a b it will be executed it will be uh, oh a b is not accepted by the string c Will AB be accepted by this PDA? Um, let's see. So you see A, you go to, you push it on top of the stack. Initially, the stack contains A, right? No, initially it contains tau. Okay, so you push A, so it becomes A tau. And then what you do is you look at the top of the stack. You pop it, you have tau here. Now there is no way you can go looking at tau anywhere from P. Understood Aditya what I'm saying? AB is not accepted by this PDA. Will you be able to accept AB? Is option A the right answer? I mean, option might be swapped. A, M, B, N, M is greater than or equal to 1 and M is greater than N. Huh. Did you understand why A, B is not the accepted by the PDA? I can explain if you don't under, didn't understand, all right? Because see, A, B, initially the stack is tau. You looked at A, made it A tau, okay? A tau and you are in S only, correct? Now you see a B, so you made it tau because your top of the stack is A, you looked at B, so you made it tau. So you are now looking at epsilon. If you look at epsilon, there is no way are looking at A because A is not the top of the stack. So this transition is not correct. And here you are not looking at B, you are looking at epsilon. So from P you are stuck, you can't go anywhere. Oh, but, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. No, 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 I think I'm wrong here. Oh, there is no transition that is correct. But the top of the stack contains only tau, which is an empty stack. Should accept. Okay, I missed that point in the question. It's written that uh, if it's an empty stack, then you will accept it. Q is not a final state. There's no concept of a final state. So yeah, no, AB is accepted. AB is accepted actually. What is your answer? What is your answer? So not Oh, because A, B is accepted. Hmm. A, B is accepted, correct. There is no point. Why would you not accept A, B? So, um, three A's and B's, it won't be accepted. Why not? Why not? Triple A, B is not accepted. Let's see, maybe I'm not. So there is three A's and B, right? So you stay here and your top of the stack is A, you stay in S, 
you say you stay in S, you will say you stay in S. Right? You see a B, so you pop off the stack, so it contains two A's, and you reach P. From P, you see an epsilon, so you are in epsilon, and you see an A on top of the stack, so you pop it and you go to Q. Right? Then again, you see an epsilon top of the stack is a so you make it tau and then stay in q and uh, when you are in epsilon it's tau epsilon yeah this question is a bit confusing see no a3b you reach q right what is the issue in this Okay, got it. No, 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 no. The answer is A, correct. There is no N less than N. A, B is not accepted. C, C, C. There is a difference between empty stack and a stack only having tau. A stack, if it has tau, is not empty, right? It has a symbol tau in it. Understood, Aditya? If a stack contains tau, that does not mean it's empty. So, M is greater than A3B is accepted, no? By the, by the, by the uh, push down automata. Did you get it? How? How is A3B accepted? No. Okay. So initially you are in S. Right? Let, let me write it in a bit. Expanded form. So you had A, 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 B. Right? Initially you are in S. Which state will you go? S itself and you will push capital A on top of the stack. Then again you see a A, where will you go? S itself, you will push A on top of the stack. Uh, so this is a transition now. Input is A. Top of the stack contains capital A, but the input is not epsilon. Na? Input is A, not epsilon. See, from S to Q, when can you go? If you see the input, epsilon. Is the input epsilon? Understood? Yes or no? Then next you will go stay in S, right? And then there is an epsilon as well. So now in this B, you are seeing this thing. If the input is B, top of the stack contains A. So you pop it of the stack and you go to P. From here, you are looking at epsilon. Top of the stack is A. You pop it and you go to Q. Over in Q, input is epsilon. Top of the stack is A. Pop it, stay in Q. Input is epsilon. Top of the stack is tau. You pop it, you stay in Q. Now your stack is empty. And if your stack is empty, your output yes because it's written it accepts the empty stack but if it would have been a b then your stack would have contained tau which is not empty understood still not clear
okay fine we'll meet tomorrow or any other questions but yeah good question this one okay we'll meet tomorrow bye